blessing. I mean, I said blessed to have you here, but it really is, it really is a blessing to have you here because yeah. you, in all accounts, like you could very well easily not be here right now, right? Very easily, and you know, and like I'm, I'm like the. Uh, First of all, it took me a long time to be comfortable with saying, like, I'm a fucking heroin addict or I'm a junkie, you know, mm. just in the sense. It's, like, so much, like... Outside of the 12-step rooms? Yeah, I mean, even just around in my social circles, my, like, my childhood friends and stuff, you know, like, to admit that, like, I had a problem and that I had gone down this path. There's so much shame and guilt and, you know, just overall, like, prejudice against what that, sti- what that label means, right? And uh, so I think that kept me in my diseases for as long as it did, but, I mean... I'm I'm a dangerous type of drug addict because I'm, like, I'm the type of drug addict that will have an apartment, that will have a, have a car, will have a, a good job, but will be behind closed doors killing myself. And those are the type of people that I feel, you know, that, that I'm not I'm not like stranded on the street. I'm not homeless. I'm not this and that. But I'm the type of person that will die behind closed doors, and people will come in and be shocked that they find me with all the all that in my system. You know, so. I say it all the time, man. I'm I'm fortunate to be and grateful to be alive and just to be like, to be able to do anything that life has for me today. So like, you know, before this journey of starting this clinical psychology program, I was trying to find myself again, you know, and... Uh, I got a question on this. Yeah, please, go ahead. Did it start out as fun? Like, uh, a lot of addictions can start out as just fun. Yeah, bro. I had a, I had a great mm-hmm. time. <laughs> you kidding? Like, yeah. uh traveling the country, going to concerts, you know, it wasn't always opiates and, you know, I was drinking and then the party drugs and social fun and, you know, getting fucked up with friends and, yeah. you know, so forth yeah. and so on. And, uh, then it kind of just took a downhill turn where like substances took over my personality, changed who I was and I pushed all those people away. And then, you know, it's a typical addict story where all of a sudden you're alone and, you know, I know the addict story. Yeah. You know, um, that's the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much the same story, more or less, mm-hmm. with like a few varying degrees. Right? Absolutely. But the onset of like when you started to like get out of control with it. Talk to us about that. Like the first time you were like you did more than you thought you were going to do or, or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, like I, like we were just talking about a second ago, I went to the University of Delaware. I played uh, D1 golf on scholarship and like probably the first time I noticed it was like something that I had an issue with or that I was a little bit out of control was like the failing of drug tests and suspensions as associated with playing, losing my scholarship. Golf. Yeah, playing golf at Delaware, you know, like I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I went to school and then like, you know, like my junior and senior year, I started seeing these like missteps of behavior and like morals that like were so out of character for me. You know, when I'm sober, I'm like humble. I'm loving i'm honest i'm caring i'm there for people that love me and all of a sudden i'm turning this person like i don't care if i'm suspended i don't want i don't need my scholarship you know like it's like so i just like noticed like like almost like chemical imbalances in my head that weren't there before Mm. you know it's all started with like a really bad breakup um with like a girl that i always thought i was on a path to marry and involved like one of my really good friends from home and them two getting together and like i was crushed and like that's heavy um and then I remember this one time, uh, this must have been my senior year of college, I had a friend drive up because he was worried about me or drive down to school and he showed up and I was just like a mess, like all sorts of messed up. And he like, I remember him looking at me. On all fi- types of drugs, all, basically. Yeah, drinking. I mean, I was at that point, I was just like trying to do anything I could to like numb the way that I was feeling. And he, I remember he walked in and he was like, bro, are you okay? And I just remember being like no (laughs) you know (laughs) like no I am not okay you know and you know that was like the start and like even though like there was like almost maybe like a moment of realization with him looking this is like one of my best friends from childhood um it still didn't deter me on the path that I went on for the next 10 years you know dealing with like these internal demons that we're learning about in school right that like I had not come to terms with didn't have the tools to live like without what I thought was the only thing I needed, maybe a girl or, you know, there was nothing that could suffice the hole that I had inside, you know? Uh, It's the nature of the beast, man. Not all of us make it. Like last year, I lost five friends to overdoses in Philadelphia. Five friends that I went to high school with passed away. You guys were really close? I mean, like three of them, like were my Mm -hmm. homies. We used to get like, you know, we used to like drink together, have fun together. And, Oh, you know, yeah, it's just, super painful. Yeah. Um, so that again, sort of accentuates like the, the, the gratitude, you know what I mean? That you're, yeah. that you're here. So with a drug like heroin, I just know from my days of partying and, you know, high school and early college and things like this, there, you know, that was like the drug we're told to stay away from. I feel like it's like, no. okay, you could do, 
you know, shrooms and the weed and the yeah, yeah, and yeah. the drinks and all that. But like, you know, I'd say by and large, people held that view of like, all right, I'm not going through that door. That yeah. heroin door is a door I'm not going through. So I want to know, were yeah, you bro, once that way? A hundred percent. Like okay. I always said, like when I was, you know, I was, I was like, I'm, a, I'm a, like, dude, I'm a white kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia. Yeah. Like I come from an upper middle class family. I had no business doing the things that I was doing, yeah. you know, like so out of place, so out of character. But yeah, I mean, I grew up, I was like, no way I'll ever touch it. Like my best friend's sister who's actually like sober now and has her life together, but like struggled with heroin addiction for years. Like when we were probably, I don't know, 13 to like 17, mm -hmm. we like, we found her oh, like dead and like bring her back to life, you know? Wow. So like, I was just like, heroin will never be something that I'll touch. Hell, like, yeah, like you said, that door will never be a door I will even touch. The yeah. doorknob, I'll never open it, right? And got like hooked on pills and then like the pills started drying up, started being more expensive. And like, well, once you're already physically dependent in, in something, then it's just like, oh, well, like I feel sick. So I'm going to do whatever I have to, wow. to feel normal. And then it's just, that door seems like it's already open for you you know it's like you don't even have to push it it's just like it's open and it's there and it's for free and it's just like mm. like, it's like the best way it's, i can describe it it's like like you're walking up to, like you're starving right and you're walking up to the kitchen pantry and you see a lock on it right and then all of a sudden you walk up and the lock just breaks off, the doors open, the lights come down on all the food, and you know that it's right there for you, right? And it's free, and it's like, it's just, it's gonna make you feel better. It's just like so funny, like I don't, I don't remember any ecstasy or any euphoria from heroin at all. Like the best, like the, the best times are from like the pills and when I had fun, but by the time I got into heroin, I was so miserable, so broken, so like just not myself. It's crazy that I don't remember like any good times from it, like not a single one. You does, know? does that heroin chapter feel like a blur, you know, in yeah, some sense? Yeah, a blur. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, not to mention like all the other things that I was putting into my system. I mean, yeah. it seemed like I went to bed at 20 and woke up at 30. That's, like, that's literally what kind of felt like my addiction was like, went to sleep. Woke up 30 in rehab, and I was just like, what the, where did my 20s go? The reason I brought that up is because one of our professors that we just had in our trauma class um, is close with Gabor Mate, who's mm -hmm. like a renowned addictions um, mm -hmm. PhD. Yep. He was saying that, his one famous saying is, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And that was huge for me yeah, to I get out from under my addiction because it's weird. When I, when I started to dig and dig and work on the pain, the need for the addiction kind of mm. lifted too. Does that yeah. make sense? No, definitely. So that's why I asked. I couldn't handle highs. I couldn't handle lows. I just wanted to live in that like dull little numb medium where I didn't have to feel. That makes sense. You know, so sense. it wasn't like a specific void or specific pain. It was just like a generalized like pain that I was in because I couldn't experience life as life was coming at me. I love Gabor though. I love Gabor. Yeah, Mata. Gabor's the shit. Yeah, he um, is. Is there a moment you remember early in your recovery where you're like, oh shit, like the light's coming back, like where, you know. Yeah, of course. Talk to us about that. So I remember like, uh, so like my detox was gnarly. It was like six weeks long, shaking, you know, sick, so forth. And I remember that first morning when I woke up and I was like, oh, I feel okay, you know, like, and I was like, it was like so foreign that like mm. I could wake up in the morning and feel okay because it was like, I'm not even kidding, eight years where you wake up in the morning and you're sick, you're, you're filled with anxiety, you're filled with fear, you know, like all these different. That's a physiological thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Physiologically mm -hmm. and, and like, and, and mentally, you yeah. know, and psychologically, because like, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, uh, once you're awake, you're sick, you're physically sick and you're, you're psychologically activated mm. where you're just like, where am I going to go next? So I remember that first morning I woke up and I was okay. And I remember I grabbed a cup of coffee and I went outside and I was like, wow. And I, I was like, I can enjoy a cup of coffee and smoke a cigarette without like rushing or feel, thinking about how bad I feel. Um, and that was kind of like, I was just like, damn, okay, maybe I can do this. You know, like maybe I can do this. You know, it's like, it's like for six That's weeks. That's a beautiful I, moment, man. That's uh, a really, really beautiful moment. Yeah. As you're sharing that, I feel like it's like when you're in active addiction, it almost feels like the cops are chasing you Dude, at all times. You know? right behind <laughs> you. Yeah, like, definitely. You got no peace. Yeah. I, that's a great way I could like breathe, you yep. know? And I was just like, okay, maybe... 
I don't know anything about like living sober or like where my life's going to go from here. But like, I know like right now mm. in this moment, I'm okay. And it's the first time I've been okay in a long time. Were you hard on yourself being like, I, I blew so many years. Like you said, I went to bed at 20, woke up at 30. Mm -hmm. Now you're cool with that. And you understand the good parts of why that happened and what that means for you today. Right. Mm -hmm. But at first was there some regret or anything you had to work through? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, bro. Uh, immense amounts of regret and shame and guilt. Like, and it was funny. I remember going into like the, uh, the LMFT that was, I was working with, um, and being like, like sitting down and just like breaking down and being like, I need to, I need to amend all my relationships with all my closest friends. I need to make up for all the lost time I had with my mom. I got to tell my best friend, I'm sorry for missing his crap. Like, you know, this, that, this, that. And you know, she's like, you just need to chill. <laughs> like you need to take a, <laughs> you need to take a breath, <laughs> That's you, great. you know, she's like, she's like, you need to like baby steps. And I'm like, I don't, I can't do baby steps. I need to, I need to, <laughs> I need to make, great. I need to make all this right. You know? So like, that was just like my, like these flooding of emotions of the wanted things to make that, up for that time the, everything I, yeah, and i wanted yeah, to do yeah. it right i wanted to leave the fucking facility and i wanted to do it right now That's you know so great. if you could say something succinctly out there because we don't know who i mean the odds are somebody tuning in might be struggling with an addiction of some mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. i think like you said the pandemic is worse than that a bit right definitely mm -hmm. so if you could say something maybe in a, a sentence or two sentences to somebody that might be listening right now that's struggling with addiction that's sort of in that sort of contemplation stage, mm -hmm. you know about that? Yeah, no, yeah, stages of change. Yeah, 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 yeah stages yeah, of change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're, I know, what is it pre-contemplation, then contemplation, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. they're somewhere in the midst of that. What would you say to them, man? Do you have anything that you think could resonate for them? <sighs> yeah. Um, the progressive nature of the disease, like no drink or drug is going to make whatever you're going through better. I can, that is like a scientific fact. It's only going to get worse. And whether that's like, you know, a steep hill where it just gets down to the bottom or it takes, it takes a little while, nothing's going to get better. Um, and then the other thing that really helped me is that things do get better once you put the drinker drunk down, you know, and like, mm -hmm. I didn't believe it. Or when, the behavior. Or the behavior, yeah, what the behavior mm -hmm. or, you know, you try to work on the, the repressed feelings of pain, whether it's, you know, like, it was, like we're talking about a breakup, as long as things do get better if you put in the effort to get better. <laughs> what and, I hear you saying is just stop putting salt in the wound yeah. and the wound will kind of, you'll, so, you'll move I, towards healing. I, I mean, like I remember when I didn't believe it. Like I remember like when I was, uh, there was like my second or third day in rehab and I had this guy telling me like every day, like things are going to get better. Things get better. And I wanted to hit the guy <laughs> in the fucking face. I wanted to be like, bro, get out of my room. You know, like I just didn't want to listen to it. And damn it. He there's was, East he was Coast right. Jason. Yeah, there he's there back. <laughs> I was like, I wanted to like knock this guy out. But like he was... I mean, it gets better and it is possible. And Amen, man. You no, know, it's like kind of no matter far, no, no matter how far down you've gone. I mean, no. really like you see I mean, people at the bottom, bottom, right? Like, you, dude, you and, know. And, and if, and if, if it's not my experience, you see it in the limelight. You see people yeah. like Steven Tyler, like Eminem or whoever you want to like that have years of recovery now mm -hmm. that have like gotten past the worst. Right. And it's mm -hmm. like, if they can do it with all the money they have and all the pressure they're under, it's true. You know, we can do it. I thought the only thing I needed to, feel better was a drink or a drug. Mm -hmm. And I thought that there was no way in hell that anything was going to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, if I put them down, it's like changing your perception of reality. And that change is one of the most difficult processes that anyone that's struggling with anything is going to go through is like the waking up and not doing the same thing that you did the day before. What makes it even harder, I think, is society. It's like, we, you know, we already feel bad about ourselves if you're mm -hmm. in active addiction, and then society kind of makes it worse in a way because yeah, yeah. you're stigmatized or you're shunned or whatever, and then a lot of people are like, well, fuck it, I'm going to go back to this and numb out and medicate more. Definitely. Am I right? And no, then it becomes yeah. this vicious cycle. And in terms of, like, the stigmas, like, you know, People are starting to finally recognize both mental health and like, you know, the associated like drug abuse and stuff as an actual disease and an actual illness. Yeah, and, and something think, to bring compassion and empathy towards, yeah, which you alluded to earlier. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And it's not so much like the shunning and like the degradation of them as a character, as like as, you know, as who they are, but actually like, okay, looking at them as like someone that has cancer. You know, Absolutely. it's like sickness. Brilliant.